أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبو القاسم محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, thank you so much for joining us once more from the holy city of Karbala. You're joining me, your host, Yahya Seymour, in which we are discussing on our usual daily show, which broadcasts to you daily, with the exception of Friday, back to the basics, in which we are coming up with a framework, a sustainable one, which is respectful to our belief system and to the belief systems of others, in which we discuss the big questions pertaining to our differences with others and a more sustainable way of reaching what could be summarized as a potential common ground. Of course, not everyone shares a common ground, and what we're trying to do is reach that common ground in order that we might be able to understand ourselves, why we adopt certain positions, and more importantly, the flaws with the beliefs of others, just for our own understanding and our own benefit, and an articulate way to describe our own reasoning to others too. We have, for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, been engaging with the very dynamic, vibrant, and quite, to quote one of its major proponents, breathtaking worldview known as the worldview of scientism, or as he framed it, science. Now, of course, this is an overgrowth of what we would call the worldview of atheism. And of course, this is why I'm taking the quote directly from the book, the Atheist's Guide to Reality by Professor Alex Rosenberg, a professor of a philosophy of science at Duke University, a very prominent school and very decent and renowned one in the United States of America. I am not by any means strawmanning him, caricaturing his position, nor attempting to defame the atheist position without elaborately citing my reasonings for the beliefs I put forward tonight as being consequences of the worldview of atheism, and more importantly, dismantling their worldview according to their own acknowledgements. Now, we are talking about bigger questions here. We're not talking about small fundamental ones such as how an atheist could justify, for example, trusting one scientist over another, no we're talking about much more fundamental concepts. And over the past few nights, we have been discussing something of the utmost importance. For indeed, when you hear anyone object to the concept of religion, object to the concept of your religion as a monotheistic believer, it's always going to be one of two sorts. It will be an intellectual objection, which of course will be difficult now that we've shown that Alex Rosenberg does not believe we can trust our thought process because everything's physical and a thought as a non-physical concept would not be very easily explained in a physicalist universe. And now the second type of objection which is leveled against the concept of monotheism and God in particular is that our religions are barbaric, archaic, and their morality is quite frankly stagnant and unadaptable for the modern world. Now of course, those who believe that this is a sustainable objection against religion would of course have to believe in a fabit or stable form of morality, which we've been showing according to the admissions of Professor Alex Rosenberg does not exist under the worldview of atheism. But is it merely Alex Rosenberg who acknowledges this? Absolutely not. Allow me to go, f go through our reservoir of quotations once more to analyze what atheists have stated about their consistent form of atheism and whether or not it accommodates for the concept of morality. Jean-Paul Sartre, the existentialist, he states the following, when we speak of abandonment, a favorite word of Heidegger, we only mean to say that God does not exist and it is necessary to draw the consequences of his absence right to the end. Namely, we have to take that major answer we give to that major question, does God exist? And we have to take all the consequences of that answer. We don't want to be like lightweights, like these new atheists who claim that no, it's merely a rejection in God. No, we want to embrace it to its full extent, something similar to what Alex Rosenberg states in his book. He states, 
the existentialist is strongly opposed to a certain type of secular moralism, a moralism which is based on secularity, which seeks to suppress God at the least possible expense, namely, when you remove God from the picture, but it has a minimal cost. He wants to avoid that. Why? Because towards 1880, when the French professors endeavored to formulate a secular morality, they said, nothing will be changed if God does not exist. We shall rediscover the same norms of honesty, progress, and humanity, and we shall have disposed of God as an out-of-date hypothesis, which will die away quietly of itself. The existentialist, on the contrary, finds it extremely embarrassing that God does not exist for there disappears with him all possibility of finding values in an intelligible heaven. There can be no longer any good a priori. A priori means to start off with. Since there is no infinite and perfect consciousness to think it. It is nowhere written that the good exists, that one must be honest or must not lie. And since we are now upon the plane where there are only men, namely, now that we've removed non-man, as great as, as a kind of concept from this universe we live in, Dostoevsky, the great Russian novelist, once wrote, if God did not exist, everything would be permitted, and that for his existentialism is the starting point. Everything is indeed permitted if God does not exist, and man is in consequence forlorn, for he cannot find to depend upon either him within or without himself outside himself rather. I'm sorry for slightly butchering that quote. Paul Kurtz likewise states, the central question about moral and ethical principles concerns their ontological foundation. By ontological foundation we mean again, where does this find its existential value? Where do we ground this belief in morality? If they are neither derived from God nor anchored in some transcendent ground, they are purely ephemeral. That is to say, if we believe in this physicalist, naturalist, scientist universe where nothing exists other than the physical compounds of different objects, then where do we derive this non-physical property of morality from? Very prominent British philosopher, popular writer on science, still alive today, Julian Beghini, he says the following, if there is no single moral authority, we have to, in some sense, create values for ourselves. By moral authority, he would mean one that transcends man, a supernatural being, a god. And that means that moral claims are not true or false. You may disagree with me, but you cannot say I have made a factual error. That is because without the concept of a god, everything becomes arbitrary. It becomes subjective. Richard Dawkins needs no introduction. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, and no God. No evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Dawkins thereafter concedes, it is pretty hard to defend absolutist morals on grounds other than religious ones. Now, again, just to elaborate slightly further, we need to point out that we are not stating by any means that atheists cannot be moral people. There are far more many atheists who are moral than there are believers at times. And this is quite frankly disgusting and shameful that we as a religious community do not always adopt the values which are part and parcel of our worldview. But that being said, we are not talking about whether or not an atheist can through imitating the religious and moral values he finds in others be moral. We are talking about whether or not, if there is no God, we can find the concept of morality. I've already stated that the atheist who says to me, well, what do you mean? There is morality, I'm a good moral person. Of course, of course you're a good and moral person because you live in the real world. You live in the world that God created and that God inhabits in his all-powerful knowledge. You see, we are not talking about merely a theoretical concept. We are talking about something much more important. When discussing a worldview, one of the great making properties of a worldview is its ability to provide explanatory power for what we see around us, what we experience in life, our thoughts and the nature of our experiences with other human beings. You see, if I would go outside 
and I would see that the floor was wet, but it's a completely sunny day. I might come to believe that someone had either utilized a hose pipe and wet the floor, or there had been a pipe burst which made water come out onto the floor, or it had been raining previously. But if my neighbor had stated, no, none of the above, and when I asked him to provide an explanation for why water came on the floor, he would say, what do you mean? Water is just on the floor. And I would say to him, no, I understand water is on the floor, but you're telling me nothing caused the water to be on the floor. And he would say, yeah, but what do you mean? There's water on the floor. This is not providing an explanatory scope for phenomenon that we view in front of us. So the atheist cannot merely appeal to the fact that human beings have morality. This does not provide an explanatory scope for morality. And of course, this leads us to something which is a lot more problematic, the concept of where morality comes from and whether or not it can be accounted for by atheism. Allow us to run through the argument once more in order for us to understand the nature of the arguments. Again, we are talking about ontological grounding, where someone provides the account for the origin of morality and not merely whether or not we can observe morality and people can be moral. If an atheist strips the universe down to merely evolution and the evolved species that have come to be human beings as well as other species in this bottomless, pitiless universe as Richard Dawkins described it, where does the concept of morality come from other than a subjective whim of the human being to wish to survive? Now, there is one route the atheist can take and this route doesn't help them very often. It's the same route they take to explain away the common phenomenon of human beings believing in God. What do they state in order to deal with this? They state that the notion of religious belief is a coping mechanism and it seems to be what motivates the evolutionary psychoanalysis. They state that the reason that vast proportions of humanity believe things are patently untrue and even ridiculous is because we have this genetic evolutionary device functioning in us that helps us believe in this as a coping mechanism because reality is so sour. Now, a great problem with this is the atheist in trying to explain away the phenomenon of religious belief has ended up shooting themselves in the foot because if they want to explain away people's religiosity as a natural basic belief due to evolutionary coping mechanisms and devices which evolution has programmed into mankind in order for them to survive, then if evolution is able to program into me false beliefs in order to survive and these false beliefs motivate me in my life, how do I know which other false beliefs evolution hasn't programmed into me? Alex Rosenberg already believes that there's no such thing as thought. Should I believe that thought is merely an evolutionary coping device which biology has programmed into me in order to survive? More importantly, let's look at some of the beliefs which could be merely useful fictions according to our biology. If evolution has installed in us these useful fictions, what else could it have installed in us as false but useful fictions in order to make us survive. Dear viewers, let's answer that question right after the break. Please bear with me. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There are plenty of other beliefs, dear viewers, as we were saying prior to the break, that evolution may have installed into us as useful but false fictions in order to allow us to survive. If we think genuinely about the concept that the atheist is trying to tell us, when they state that many people believe in the concept of God and gods as a useful surviving coping mechanism installed into the human by evolution, what else would this entail? If I can't trust 
my beliefs anymore, if I can't trust my thoughts anymore because it installs into me useful fictional devices in order to make me survive and cope, what else could be a useful fictional belief that I need to empirically test? The belief that the future will always be like the past and that we can assume normality and function could just be a useful fiction which evolution has instilled in me. The belief that the laws of physics will hold in the same way everywhere could also just be a useful fiction. The belief that human beings have some kind of value both collectively and as individuals could likewise be a useful fiction and the belief that the physical world actually exists externally as I believe it to could be a useful fiction. In fact, the belief that other minds exist and that this isn't all just an illusion in which I'm a brain in a vat, what we call solipsism could also be a useful fictional belief. How do I know that evolution hasn't just caused me to believe these things in order for me to survive the cold and harsh reality that I'm the only mind? Now someone could say to me, well, another mind can engage with yours and it can come and slap you. That's true. But how do I know that wouldn't be a computer feeding computer waves into my brain to make me believe that? You see, when you open up this can of worms of biologically programmed useful fictions, you really don't have anywhere to go. And so what we see is that it would also open up another can of worms, which is what? It would open up the can of worms that we shouldn't trust anything including the belief in morality. So let's look at three different reasons for why atheists should actually reject, disregard and completely discard morality in its entirety as a religious useful fiction which humanity has outgrown. Number one, we have no obligations to evolution. What I mean by that is whilst it is indeed true that most people share a strong sense that we should not torture, for example, children for fun. We know that this is just an evolved instinct that promotes survival, if we want to look at it from an evolutionist perspective. It is no different in principle from the instinct to prefer certain tastes and taste buds and sensations over others, or to avoid, for example, sleeping in the ocean. So it's ridiculous to think that we have an obligation to what evolution has programmed us to believe. If I believe something so strongly, but I know that evolution might have tricked me into believing that, then why should I hold on to it? I don't have an obligation to prefer certain tastes over others as evolution has pro programmed my body to do, nor do I have an obligation to prefer not to sleep in the ocean. Many of us might even prefer to follow that due to what evolution has done to ourselves and our taste buds and our thought process, but it's certainly not wrong or morally, morally condemnable to go against evolution. So this language and this way of thinking is merely an outgrowth of the concept of religious obligation, which I don't necessarily have to follow. And because I don't owe evolution anything, why should I believe in morality? That's the first reason that an atheist probably should reject the concept of morality. Number two, evolution often selects for false beliefs. And what do I mean by evolution often selects false beliefs? Evolution, as we've seen in previous episodes, as is cited, by people like Patricia Churchland is concerned with what? It's not concerned with truth making properties, it's not concerned with discovering reality, it's concerned with what? The four F's, fighting, fleeing, food and reproduction. Now she states that word the four F's, this is not my term, I want to make that very clear, this is not my term, we can call it triple FR, fighting, fleeing, food and reproduction. It's not concerned with anything else. It's not concerned with finding truth. It's not concerned with philosophical problems. As Charles Darwin himself stated, he struggles 
to believe whether or he struggles to know whether or not he should trust his own mind because would we ever trust the whims and reasoning of a monkey now for some atheists that might be watching this i'm not saying that we've evolved from monkeys i'm saying that we share a common ancestor as the theory states so if we wouldn't trust the reasoning and wisdom of a monkey if there indeed is any as charles darwin states why is this it's because again evolution has programmed them to concern themselves with triple f r fighting fleeing food and reproduction it's not concerned them with thinking about truth and if we don't concern ourselves with truth then what would be the point why would i trust for example a device designed to calculate the location of water under the ground in order to guide me to the nearest airport. If a device wasn't designed to act as a GPS, it probably wouldn't function very well as a GPS. Likewise, if evolution has programmed my body to concern itself with the triple FR, fighting, fleeing, food and reproduction, it probably hasn't really worked it out for me to concern myself with discovering patterns of truth and the reality of the universe, when especially that reality could be extremely brutal for me. So that's the second reason why, according to atheism, there's probably a good reason to not trust our sense of morality. Thirdly, obligation is not a property of particles. That is to say, since we are nothing but a series of particles and matter in motion and it is absurd to think that matter can have obligations to other matter simply by virtue of its being structured in a particular way, it is therefore just as absurd to think that a human being can have obligations to other human beings as to think that a beaker of acid can have obligations to another beaker of acid or that a book can have obligations to another book. This is the third reason for why evolution and the atheist belief in evolution probably should lead us to cast doubt in the concept of morality. But do we really want to go down the rabbit hole and embrace Alice in Wonderland as some of these people would have us do? Dear viewers, we'll continue this analysis tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala. Thank you once more for joining us and please do not forget us in your duas. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank mm -hmm. you.